So today on the Startup Investor Podcast, we are with John Richards, a longtime friend, probably one of my oldest mentors, who's taught me so much about startups. About, oh my gosh, how long ago was the Utah Angels? I graduated in like 2008. The Utah Angels ran from the mid to late 90s till about 2010. Yeah, so John Richards plays an extremely important part of my career because he was a mentor who allowed me to go to his investor meetings with him. And in the process, I was able to learn a ton about startups. Probably the biggest lesson that I've learned, I've taken from my time with you, is too many people don't focus on generating revenue. They focus on the story, they focus on the team, but no one wants to go out and knock doors. And that was probably if I took one lesson from you and all those people, hundreds of people you let me meet, I got to see their financials. It's just most people and most startups don't want to sell. So anyways, Mm -hmm. that's the important part that John Richards has played in my life. Thank you. So we're going to talk about John Richards background and why he'd be an excellent angel investor in your startup. We're going to talk about his investment thesis deals that he's done. And really, I kind of look at this as kind of like a matchmaking service. You're looking for an investor. Would John Richards be a good fit for you? So first, let's talk about kind of some of the recent deals that you've done. I know you've done Route, mm-hmm. you've done VidAngel. What are some, some of these deals? Can you mention amounts that you've written checks for? Because you're not like a $5,000 no, investor. No, I, I have a lot of philosophies around that. I don't feel like we go into that. This is the viewer's chance to get to know you. Okay. So uh, most angel investors are actually formerly successful entrepreneurs because they ha- ha- have an exit from their venture and have money and many of them or most of them lose a lot of money the first year they become an angel investor because angel investing skills are different than entrepreneur skills so it's very very common that first year a newly wealthy entrepreneur who's exited loses a lot of money angel investing and the common reasons for that are because they do too much and too few deals so too much in each deal and too few deals so and i did that too what were your first deals like like give, me, like, give us numbers examples yeah a little i did a uh, half a million dollars in a deal that ended up badly and was it the star money. stardust was yeah. this that one yeah <laughs> so stardust you were also he was also a byu professor and i think you talked about one star where you you got like a shirt that cost you a half million dollars yeah that was freeport that was freeport <laughs> yeah yeah okay that was actually uh jeff curl's first company okay yeah <laughs> he's, he's come a long way <laughs> yes yes so you put half a million dollars into stardust was this one of your first investments yes back in 99 or 2000. Okay. Was this the largest check you've ever written? Um, to a startup, to a you know pre-revenue early stage startup, yes. Okay. Um, but uh, also going into funds, I went into a fund for a million dollars. That was too much for that fund, and that fund didn't do that well. But that was some bad luck. Its previous fund had done well, but the next fund didn't do as well, and that's the one I was in. It's okay. It got it like a seven percent IRR, which is very poor. Okay. It's it better than eight, a eight, negative eight, IRR. Yeah, yeah, it took 18 years. Okay. Yeah, to get that out. That's an interesting one. So the rule of thumb is that if you had $500,000 to invest in venture, you would take 250000 and spread it across 10 companies with 25000 each into the company. It may take a year maybe to deploy it, however long, and save the second 250000 after 12 to 24 months of which are the two best performing ones of those 10 and then double triple quadruple down into those deals and put 125,000 each let's say into the two best ones that's the philosophy i learned watching some of the best angel investors take an angel investor like scott frazier who you know mm-hmm. who's very prominent in utah and has done a lot of investing had a lot of success and he does a lot of small initial investments in a lot of companies and then buys up existing uh, stock or and goes into new offerings on the winners and then doubles, triples, quadruples down. And that's how you win as an angel investor. The mistake if I had $500,000 would be saying, oh, I'm going to put $250,000 into two different companies and that's it. The first two that I find. That's a good way to lose all your money. And so that philosophy I've learned, uh, lean startup, which hit the world about 2007 and has swept the globe the last 14 years also is not only good for entrepreneurs, it helps angel investors be better angel investors. So since about 2010, when I was fully committed to Lean Startup, I've become a much better angel investor, which would have been after the time you were uh, one of the executive directors of Utah Angels, because that's you did that. Mm-hmm. And um, It was like a glorified internship. Yes. And so um, how we invested during the you know 2000s uh, was on old models and old ways 
ways of thinking about startups. And since 2010, I back tested my entire career as an entrepreneur and angel investor with Lean Startup, and that explained why I succeeded and failed. And so I've followed that, and I've been a much more successful investor since then. And that's because of going into many deals with a small amount and doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on the winners, and then making sure who I'm investing in is following good Lean Startup principles. So initially, you went in very hot and heavy, like mm-hmm. with Starlink, half a million. Today in 2021, what would your... First, and I'm a very early stage investor, so I would okay. do 25 to 100,000 would be the, you know, and probably 25 to 75,000. 100,000 is a whole different ball game than you're starting. But super early, pre-revenue type companies, that's what I would do in ones like that. How many of these are you doing on an, and on what? I do probably about three to four a year. Okay. And I have about 25 current ones. Okay. And um, it's been a really good year, though. The funny thing is COVID's been interesting. Just last night and this is breaking news and I can't tell you who it is. Okay. I came home from playing pickleball. You know, I'm a competitive pickleball player. Are you uh, ranked as a pickleball champion? Um, not ranked, but I'm a gold medalist in uh, my age group and different events and my skill level. But that's another story. I came home last night and found out that literally, unbeknownst to me, a company that I had a small percentage in from seven, eight years ago, for somebody who was in the second year of Boom Startup, that that company failed. Okay. His next company is being sold and it's being sold for quite a nice sum and my small percentage is going to be a nice windfall. So this is how this COVID year has been. There's so much money in the market from stimulus money that the venture industry is full of money and there's so many M&A deals happening. It's crazy and the valuations are so high. It's been nuts. And so a lot of my investing from seven to 12 years ago is now coming home and having exits. It's really been a fascinating thing. But that's the amounts that I do. And then we see how they go. And then I usually get involved in mentoring and helping form advisory boards and helping them segue to the next real round of investment with a professional venture firm. Okay. How many of these deals are pre-revenue? Most of them are going to be pre-revenue. And on a pre-revenue deal, I'd assume you'd then be more of like a $25,000 check. Yeah. That 25 is a very common amount. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do these- Like VidAngel. I was the first investor in VidAngel, did 25,000. Okay. And they were just an idea on a piece of paper. Out of the startups that you fund, how many of them are truly like a college student pre-revenue versus someone like the Harmons who have had experience? Because get, getting an investor as pre-revenue is really tricky. I yeah. think you hear about it in Silicon Valley, but yeah. I feel like there's always a backstory. You knew a VC partner. I think I'd answer, say, 50-50. I still say there are some I believe in because uh, they have a good model. Like, for instance, Route was interesting. Okay. Route was two founders, and they were trying to figure out what to do. And they actually had toyed with the business model and done pretty good traction and then took a complete year off and didn't have any new customers for a year. And when they explained their business model, though, just on the business model basis, I go, that is one of the best business models I've seen. And we invested just based on that because it was a really good business model. And I hadn't seen not, you know, one was a former student of mine at BYU. Can we talk more about like the route deal? Like what was attractive about route? You- route, their initial business model is shipping insurance for e-commerce. Okay. So. And they were heavily MLM to begin with, right? Their main business is Shopify stores. So there's one and a half to two million Shopify stores. And Shopify stores, if they're selling, you know, items for 100 to 300 $500 or more, purchasers are nervous about uh, whether they're going to get what they've ordered, right? Because they're mm-hmm. a no-name store on Shopify. Mm-hmm. They're not Amazon. You know, mm-hmm. we're all comfortable doing whatever on Amazon, but if it's a no-name Shopify store, we get a little nervous if we spend $500 on something. Is it going to come? Is it going to come damaged? What happens if I have to return it? All that. So the business model, initial business model of route is, you know, have a checkbox at the checkout and mm-hmm. you pay 1% of the purchase price for shipping insurance. So if anything's damaged or broken or doesn't come, the insurance covers it completely. And the take ratio was extraordinarily high. And I due diligence those numbers. And it was amazing how many purchasers check on that. And the claims rate is very low. So you look at the numbers in that business model, it's very strong. Okay. Of the deals that you're a part of, are you typically a lead investor or are you following on? I used to be, and that was a mistake. <laughs> so um, uh, I don't like to be the lead investor, except at that very early stage, I will be a co-investor with all of us doing about the same amount. But I don't want to take the bulk of a deal or the largest part and be the lead investor because I have too much activity and too many things I do. And that requires the ability to put in more money and to follow on more actively and that type of thing. So I encourage people to go out and find lead investors, and then I will 
try to close out the round. That's my favorite thing to do. So for instance, somebody's raising four hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars and they got a lead investor come in and do one hundred and fifty, that lead investor is usually gonna have friends and family they want in because they're now excited and they'll get it up to like three hundred thousand. And if they need the last hundred thousand, then my circle of friends and I can come up and do something like that. Okay. On a deal like that, are you guiding the terms at all? Are you saying this well, is where well, I'm in, I'm out? A lot of people, and it's come to Utah now, want to do safe notes okay. and stuff. And I don't Can you like, explain what a safe note is for those who may not be Simple familiar? agreement for equity that was invented by Y Combinator and okay. its attorneys. And it's a weird uh, structure because it's not debt and it's not equity. It's a simple agreement for future equity. And so it doesn't have a lot of protections for investors. So I'm kind of a, you know, some people won't like this, but I just don't like safe and I've never invested in a safe note. I try to get the entrepreneur to scale it back just a little bit and give a little more protection for the investor and do what's called a kiss keep it simple security which was invented by 500 startups Mm -hmm. and do a kiss debt version so it's convertible debt but super entrepreneur friendly convertible debt and that's a bulk of my last six investments are on kiss debt terms what is your current investment thesis my favorite of all types of businesses are a b2b SaaS platform you know that maybe involves a crm or pos point of sale system running in an industry or vertical. I'll give an example. For instance, like here in Utah, there was a guy that was running a lighting showroom company. Okay. So, and then he writes his own software to run a lighting showroom company and the software ends up being better than anything on the market. And so he divests himself of his lighting showroom company and becomes a software guy doing lighting showroom software and it becomes the number one lighting showroom software in the industry and uh, really advances the industry too because he helped also build the lighting showroom SKU database, which was really interesting. And then that, it's the same thing I did in my history where I was a Yellow Pages guy and I, I helped Yellow Pages go on the internet. But I, So somebody from that industry that makes the software to make that industry better and it's a B2B SaaS business. That's my favorite. Okay. What are your turnoffs for doing an investment? Well, depends. If they've had a premature scaling activity and squandered a lot of money and now they're about to die, but they still have something good, you could go in and invest at a low valuation, a down round and maybe get involved. That's what I, happened with Omniture, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Omniture was at 65 million, almost having an exit and the exit fell through. And there was a later investment made at 8 million. Okay. Wow. <laughs> What are your other red flags? Uh, lots of red flags. So um, just not having a complete team. If you, you know, a business, two business guys, and they don't have a tech co-founder, that's tough, right? They don't have anybody to manage their tech development and that type of thing, or vice versa, a tech guy that has no business sense or acumen or experience, and he thinks he can be the CEO. Um, so team issues are big. They have done no customer validation. For post-revenue deals, are you looking for a certain growth rate? If you're in a post-revenue deal, you want to see six months of 10% month over month growth. Okay. That's the dream. Okay. What's yep. the best way to, if someone wants to get funded to reach you? They can uh, reach me at, you know, jrichards at startupignition.com is my email address. And if they have any questions about Startup Ignition or me or whatever, if they approach me, don't be surprised that I will immediately ask for a lot of information that's somewhat onerous to put together because you need to have your ducks in order in order to get money from investors, especially sophisticated investors that know what they're doing. It's not just, you know, using your persuasive skills to close investment dollars. You've got to really show that you're worthy of investment. So I often, even before having a first meeting, have people fill out a three page form I have for investment due diligence. So Okay. Yeah. Well thanks for sharing your thoughts and thanks for being on the show. Thank you, John. Thanks for being such a good friend and congratulations on your recent marriage thanks, and uh, for all of the good work you're doing and for helping people build their products with your uh, solutions. Awesome. Well, thanks.